the carriage lamps. It was the fault of a small nickel-plated revolver, a most incompetent weapon, which, wherever one aimed, would fling the bullet as the devil willed, and no man, when about to use it, could tell exactly what was in store for the surrounding country. This treasure had been acquired by Jimmy Trescott after arduous bargaining with another small boy. Jimmy wended homeward, patting his hip pocket at every three paces. Peter Washington, working in the carriage house, looked out upon him with a shrewd eye. "'Oh, Jim,' he called, "'what you got in your hand pocket?' "'Nothing,' said Jimmy, feeling carefully under his jacket to make sure that the revolver wouldn't fall out. Peter chuckled. "'Some more foolishness, I reckon. "'You gwine be hung one day, Jim. "'You keep up all dish year nonsense.' Jimmy made no reply, but went into the back garden, where he hid the revolver in a box under a lilac bush. Then he returned to the vicinity of Peter, and began to cruise to and fro in the offing, showing all the signals of one wishing to open treaty. "'Pete,' he said, "'how much does a box of cartridges cost?' Peter raised himself violently, holding in one hand a piece of harness and in the other an old rag. "'Cartridges!' "'Cartridges! Land sake! What the kid want with cartridges? Knew it! Knew it! Come home or holdin' on to his hand pocket like he got money in it, and now he want cartridges!' Jimmy, after viewing with dismay the excitement caused by his question, began to move warily out of the reach of a possible hostile movement. "'Cartridges!' continued Peter, in scorn and horror. "'Kid like you, no bigger in a minute. "'Look y'all, Jim, you done been swappin' round, "'and you done got hold of a pistol.' "'The charge was dramatic. "'The wind was almost knocked out of Jimmy "'by this display of Peter's terrible miraculous power, "'and as he backed away, his feeble denials "'were more convincing than a confession. "'I'll tell your pop,' cried Peter in virtuous grandeur. "'I'll tell your pop. In the distance Jimmy stood appalled. He knew not what to do. The dread adult wisdom of Peter Washington had laid bare the sin and disgrace stared at Jimmy. There was a whirl of wheels and a high, lean-trotting mare spun Dr. Trescott's buggy towards Peter, who ran forward busily. As the doctor climbed out, Peter, holding the mare's head, began his denunciation. Doctor, I gwin tell on Jim. He come home or holdin' on to his hind pocket and proud like he won a tucker raffle, and I sure know what he been up to, and I done challenge him, and he never say he didn't. Why, what do you mean? said the doctor. What's this, Jimmy? The boy came forward, glaring wrathfully at Peter. In fact, he suddenly was so filled with rage at Peter that he forgot all precautions. It's about a pistol, he said bluntly. I've got a pistol. I swapped for it. I done told him his pop wouldn't stand no firearms, and him a kid like he is. I done told him, land sake, he strut like he was a soldier. Come in yer proud and are holding on to his hind pocket. He think it was Jesse James, I reckon. But I done told him his pop stand no such foolishness. First thing, blam, he shoot his head off. No, sir. He too tiny to come in here struttin' like he just bought Main Street. I told him I done told him shop. I don't want to be loafin' round this year stable if Jim he gwine go shootin' round and shootin' round. Bim, bam, bam. No, sir, I retires, I retires. It's all right if a grown man got her gun, but ain't no kids come foolishin' round me with firearms. No, sir, I retires. Oh, be quiet, Peter, said the doctor. Where is this thing, Jimmy? The boy went sulkily to the box under the lilac bush and returned with the revolver. Here, tis, he said with a glare over his shoulder at Peter. The doctor looked at the silly weapon in critical contempt. It's not much of a thing, Jimmy, but I don't think you're quite old enough for it yet. I'll keep it for you in one of the drawers of my desk. Peter Washington burst out proudly. I done told him the doctor wouldn't stand no trafficking round ye with firearms. I done told him. 
Jimmy and his father went together into the house, and as Peter unharnessed the mare, he continued his comments on the boy and the revolver. He was not cast down by the absence of hearers. In fact, he usually talked better when there was no one to listen save the horses. But now his observations bore small resemblance to his earlier and public statements. Admiration and the keen family pride of a southern negro, who has been long in one place, were now in his tone. "'That boy! He's her devil! When he get to be her man, wow! He'll just take and make things whirl round yer. Reckon we'll all take her back seat when he comes along a raisin' cane.' He had unharnessed the mare, and with his back bent was pushing the buggy into the carriage house. "'Her pistol! And him no bigger than a minute!' A small stone whizzed past Peter's head and clattered on the stable. He hastily dropped all occupation and struck a curious attitude. His right knee was almost up to his chin, and his arms were wreathed protectingly about his head. He had not looked in the direction from which the stone had come, but he had begun immediately to yell. "'You, Jim, quit! Quit, I tell you! Jim, watch out! You go on break something, Jim!' "'Yah!' taunted the boy, as with the speed and ease of a light cavalryman he maneuvered in the distance. "'Yah! Toll on me, did you? Toll on me, eh? There, how do you like that?' The missiles resounded against the stable. "'Watch out, Jim, you go on break something!' "'Jim, I tell you, quit your foolishness. "'Jim, ow! Watch out, boy! I—' "'There was a crash. "'With diabolical ingenuity, "'one of Jimmy's pebbles had entered the carriage house "'and had landed among a row of carriage lamps on a shelf, "'creating havoc which was apparently "'beyond all reason of physical law. "'It seemed to Jimmy that the racket of falling glass "'could have been heard in an adjacent county.' Peter was a prophet who, after persecution, was suffered to recall everything to the mind of the persecutor. There, knew it, knew it. Now I reckon you'll quit. Hi, just look at these yer lamps. For land's sake. Oh, now your pop just break every bone in your body. In the doorway of the kitchen, the cook appeared with a startled face. Jimmy's father and mother came suddenly out on the front veranda. "'What was that noise?' called the doctor. Peter went forward to explain. "'Jimmy was her even rocks at me, doctor, "'and her long come one rock and go blam into all the lamps "'and just skitter em to bits, I declare.' Jimmy, half blinded with emotion, "'was nevertheless aware of a lightning glance from his father, "'a glance which cowed and frightened him to the ends of his toes.' He heard the steady but deadly tones of his father in a fury. "'Go into the house and wait until I come.' Bowed in anguish, the boy moved across the lawn and up the steps. His mother was standing on the veranda, still gazing towards the stable. He loitered in the faint hope that she might take some small pity on his state. But she could have heeded him no less if he had been invisible. He entered the house." When the doctor returned from his investigation of the harm done by Jimmy's hand, Mrs. Trescott looked at him anxiously, for she knew that he was concealing some volcanic impulses. Well, she asked. It isn't the lamps, he said at first. He seated himself on the rail. I don't know what we are going to do with that boy. It isn't so much the lamps as it is the other thing. He was throwing stones at Peter because Peter told me about the revolver. "'What are we going to do with him?' "'I'm sure I don't know,' replied the mother. "'We've tried almost everything. "'Of course, much of it's pure animal spirits. "'Jimmy is not naturally vicious.' "'Oh, I know,' interrupted the doctor impatiently. "'Do you suppose, when the stones were singing about Peter's ears, "'he cared whether they were flung by a boy who was naturally vicious "'or a boy who was not?' The question might interest him afterward, but at the time he was mainly occupied in dodging these effects of pure animal spirits. "'Don't be too hard on the boy, Ned. There's lots of time yet. He's so young yet, and I believe he gets most of his naughtiness from that wretched Dalzel boy. That Dalzel boy. Well, he's simply awful. 
Then, with true motherly instinct to shift blame from her own boy's shoulders, she proceeded to sketch the character of the Dalzel boy in lines that would have made that talented young vagabond stare. It was not admittedly her feeling that the doctor's attention should be diverted from the main issue and his indignation divided among the camps, but presently the doctor felt himself burn with wrath for the Dalzel boy. "'Why don't you keep Jimmy away from him?' he demanded. "'Jimmy has no business consorting with abandoned little predestined jailbirds like him. "'If I catch him on the place, I'll box his ears.' "'It is simply impossible unless we kept Jimmy shut up all the time,' said Mrs. Trescott. "'I can't watch him every minute of the day, and the moment my back is turned, he's off.' "'I should think those Dalzel people would hire somebody to bring up their child for them,' said the doctor. "'They don't seem to know how to do it themselves.' "'Presently you would have thought from the talk that one Willie Dalzel had been throwing stones at Peter Washington, because Peter Washington had told Dr. Trescott that Willie Dalzel had come into possession of a revolver. "'In the meantime, Jimmy had gone into the house to await the coming of his father.' He was in a rebellious mood. He had not intended to destroy the carriage lamps. He had been merely hurling stones at a creature whose perfidy deserved such action, and the hitting of the lamps had been merely another move of the great conspirator fate to force one Jimmy Trescott into dark and troublous ways. The boy was beginning to find the world a bitter place. He couldn't win appreciation for a single virtue, he could only achieve quick, rigorous punishment for his misdemeanors. Everything was an enemy. Now there were those silly old lamps. What were they doing up on that shelf anyhow? It would have been just as easy for them at the time to have been in some other place. But no, there they had been, like the crowd that is passing under the wall when the mason for the first time in twenty years lets fall a brick. Furthermore, the flight of that stone had been perfectly unreasonable. It had been a sort of freak in physical law. Jimmy understood that he might have thrown stones from the same fatal spot for an hour without hurting a single lamp. He was a victim, that was it. Fate had conspired with the detail of his environment to simply hound him into a grave or into a cell. But who would understand? Who would understand? And here the boy turned his mental glance in every direction and found nothing but what was to him the black of cruel ignorance. Very well, some day they would... From somewhere out in the street he heard a peculiar whistle of two notes. It was the common signal of the boys in the neighborhood, and judging from the direction of the sound, it was apparently intended to summon him. He moved immediately to one of the windows of the sitting-room. It opened upon a part of the grounds remote from the stables and cut off from the veranda by a wing. He perceived Willie Dalzel loitering in the street. Jimmy whistled the signal after having pushed up the window-sash some inches. He saw the Dalzel boy turn and regard him, and then call several other boys. They stood in a group and gestured. These gestures plainly said, "'Come out. We've got something on hand.' Jimmy sadly shook his head. But they did not go away. They held a long consultation. Presently Jimmy saw the intrepid Dalzel boy climb the fence and begin to creep among the shrubbery, in elaborate imitation of an Indian scout. In time he arrived under Jimmy's window and raised his face to whisper, "'Come on out. We're going on a bear hunt.' "'A bear hunt!' Of course, Jimmy knew that it would not be a real bear hunt, but would be a sort of carouse of pretension and big talking and preposterous lying and valor, wherein each boy would strive to have himself called Kit Carson by the others. He was profoundly affected. However, the parental word was upon him, and he could not move. No, he answered, I can't. I've got to stay in. Are you a prisoner? demanded the Dalzel boy eagerly. "'No, yes, I suppose I am.' The other lad became much excited, but he did not lose his wariness. "'Don't you want to be rescued?' "'Well, 
"'No, I, I don't know,' replied Jimmy dubiously. Willie Dalzel was indignant. "'Why, of course you want to be rescued. "'We'll rescue you. "'I'll go and get my men.' And thinking this a good sentence, he repeated pompously, "'I'll go and get my men.' He began to crawl away, but when he was distant some ten paces, he turned to say, "'Keep up a stout heart. "'Remember that you have friends who will be faithful unto death. "'The time is not now far off when you will again view the blessed sunlight.' The poetry of these remarks filled Jimmy with ecstasy, and he watched eagerly for the coming of the friends who would be faithful unto death. They delayed some time, for the reason that Willie Dalzel was making a speech. "'Now, men,' he said, "'our comrade is a prisoner in yon, in yond, in that there fortress. "'We must to the rescue. "'Who volunteers to go with me?' He fixed them with a stern eye. There was a silence, and then one of the smaller boys remarked, "'If Doc Trescott catches us tracking over his lawn!' Willie Dalzel pounced upon the speaker and took him by the throat. The two presented a sort of burlesque of the wood cut on the cover of a dime novel, which Willie had just been reading, The Red Captain, a tale of the pirates of the Spanish Main. "'You are a coward,' said Willie, through his clenched teeth. "'No, I ain't, Willie,' piped the other as best he could. "'I say you are,' cried the great chieftain indignantly. "'Don't tell me I'm a liar.' He relinquished his hold upon the coward and resumed his speech. "'You know me, men. Many of you have been my followers for long years. You saw me slay six-handed Dick with my own hand.' "'You know I never falter. "'Our comrade is a prisoner in the cruel hands of our enemies. "'Ah, oh, Pete Washington, he dasn't. "'My pa says if Pete ever troubles me, he'll brain him. "'Come on, to the rescue. "'Who will go with me to the rescue? "'Ah, oh, come on, what are you afraid of?' "'It was another instance of the power of eloquence upon the human mind.' There was only one boy who was not thrilled by this oration, and he was a boy whose favorite reading had been of the road agents and gunfighters of the Great West, and he thought the whole thing should be conducted in the Deadwood Dick manner. This talk of a comrade was silly. Pard was the proper word. He resolved that he would make a show of being a pirate, and keep secret the fact that he really was Hold Up Harry, the terror of the Sierras. But the others were knit close in piratical bonds. One by one they climbed the fence at a point hidden from the house by tall shrubs. With many a low-breathed caution, they went upon their perilous adventure. Jimmy was grown tired of waiting for his friends who would be faithful unto death. Finally he decided he would rescue himself. It would be a gross breach of rule, but he couldn't sit there all the rest of the day waiting for his faithful unto death friends. The window was only five feet from the ground. He softly raised the sash and threw one leg over the sill. But at the same time, he perceived his friends snaking among the bushes. He withdrew his leg and waited, seeing that he was now to be rescued in an orthodox way. The brave pirates came nearer and nearer. Jimmy heard a noise of a closing door, and, turning, he saw his father in the room, looking at him and the open window in angry surprise. Boys never faint, but Jimmy probably came as near to it as may the average boy. "'What's all this?' asked the doctor, staring. Involuntarily, Jimmy glanced over his shoulder through the window. His father saw the creeping figures. "'What are those boys doing?' he said sharply, and he knit his brows. "'Nothing.' "'Nothing.' "'Don't tell me that. Are they coming here to the window?' Y "'Yes, sir.' "'What for?' To, "'To see me.' "'What about?' "'About... about nothing.' "'What about?' Jimmy knew that he could conceal nothing. He said, "'They're coming to... to... to rescue me.' He began to whimper. The doctor sat down heavily. "'What?' "'To rescue you?' he gasped. Y "'Yes, sir.' The doctor's eyes began to twinkle. 
Very well, he said presently. I will sit here and observe this rescue, and on no account do you warn them that I am here, understand? Of course Jimmy understood. He had been mad to warn his friends, but his father's mere presence had frightened him from doing it. He stood trembling at the window while the doctor stretched in an easy chair near at hand. They waited. The doctor could tell by his son's increasing agitation that the great moment was near. Suddenly he heard Willie Dalzell's voice hiss out a word. Silence! Then the same voice addressed Jimmy at the window. Good cheer, my comrade. The time is now at hand. I have come. Never did the red captain turn his back on a friend. One minute more and you will be free. Once aboard, my gallant craft, and you can bid defiance to your haughty enemies. Why don't you hurry up? What are you standing there looking like a cow for? Ah, uh, er, now, you, stammered Jimmy. Here, hold up Harry, the terror of the Sierras, evidently concluded that Willie Dalzell had had enough of the premier part. So he said, Brace up, pard. Don't you turn white-livered now? "'For you know that, hold up, Harry. "'The terror of the Sarahs ain't the man to... "'Oh, stop it,' said Willie Dalzell. "'He won't understand that, you know. "'He's a pirate. "'Now, Jimmy, come on. "'Be of light heart, my comrade. "'Soon you... "'I'll low arter all this year long time in jail. "'You thought ye had no friends, mebby. "'But I tell ye, hold up, Harry. "'The terror of the Sarahs. "'A boat is waitin'. I have ready a trusty hoss. Willie Dalzell could endure his rival no longer. Look here, Henry. You're spoiling the whole thing. We're all pirates, don't you see? And you're a pirate, too. I ain't a pirate. I'm hold up Harry, the terror of the Sarahs. You ain't, I say, said Willie in despair. You're spoiling everything you are. All right, now you wait. I'll fix you for this, see if I don't. Oh, come on, Jimmy. A boat awaits us at the foot of the rocks. In one short hour, you'll be free forever from your ex exuable enemies and their vile plots. Hasten, for the dawn approaches. The suffering Jimmy looked at his father and was surprised at what he saw. The doctor was doubled up like a man with the colic. He was breathing heavily. The boy turned again to his friends. "'Ah, uh, now, look here,' he began, stumbling among the words. "'You, I, I, I don't think I'll be rescued today.' The pirates were scandalized. "'What?' they whispered angrily. "'Ain't you going to be rescued?' "'Well, all right for you, Jimmy Trescott. "'That's a nice way to act, that is.' Their upturned eyes glowered at Jimmy. Suddenly Dr. Trescott appeared at the window with Jimmy. "'Oh, go home, boys!' he gasped, but they did not hear him. Upon the instant, they had whirled and scampered away like deer. The first lad to reach the fence was the red captain, but hold up Harry, the terror of the Sierras, was so close that there was little to choose between them. Dr. Trescott lowered the window and then spoke to his son in his usual quiet way. Jimmy, I wish you would go and tell Peter to have the buggy ready at seven o'clock. "'Yes, sir,' said Jimmy, and he swaggered out to the stables. "'Pete, father wants the buggy ready at seven o'clock.' Peter paid no heed to this order, but with the tender sympathy of a true friend, he inquired, "'Hut? Hurt? Did what hurt?' "'You're trouncing.' "'Trouncing?' said Jimmy contemptuously. "'I didn't get any trouncing.' "'No,' said Peter.' He gave Jimmy a quick, shrewd glance and saw that he was telling the truth. He began to mutter and mumble over his work. Ump, ump, these yer white folks act like the thinker boys made her glass. No trouncing, ump. He was consumed with curiosity to learn why Jimmy had not felt a heavy parental hand. But he did not care to lower his dignity by asking questions about it. At last, however, he reached the limits of his endurance and in a voice pretentiously careless, he asked, "'Didn't your pop take on like mad about these yer carriage lamps?' "'Carriage lamps?' inquired Jimmy. "'Ump.' "'No, he didn't say anything about carriage lamps. 
Not that I remember. Maybe he did, though. Let me see. Mm, nope. He never mentioned them. End of Carriage Lamps 